Hi, everyone. My name is Tamara Napper, and I want to thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for kind of uh, have your patience with some of our technical stuff. Um, today's lecture is Punishing Immigrants, U.S. Immigration Enforcement, and the Prison Industrial Complex. And I'll talk a little bit about what my motivation was for um, proposing this lecture. But first, I want to thank Sean Larson at Haymarket Books who I have now collaborated with on three of these events, or no, now about, I think, um, yeah, three or four at this point. Um, and for all the technical support of him and other Haymarket Book staff during this time, I also wanna thank uh, Tess, who's doing uh, live closed captioning, as well as David and Kami, who are doing um, ASL for us. So thank you all uh, for making this possible. I also wanna just note um, two organizations, we're gonna be sharing some of the donations um, that you have generously given um, to the organizations Black Alliance for Just Immigration or BAJI, as well as Undocu Black. So before I begin, I just wanted to kind of say why I was interested in um, kind of proposing this lecture. I um, have been thinking a lot about immigration enforcement for about the last 20 or so years. Um, and years ago, I was very interested in kind of the racial politics of immigrant, um, real writing on kind of immigration enforcement in terms of deportations was for the black commentator. And Glenn Ford, who uh, passed away uh, fairly recently, um, he was um, an editor and publisher there before he and others left to create Black Agenda Report. And Glenn um, published a lot of my work at Black Commentary and Black Agenda Report, including some of my work on thinking about where were Black immigrants in the deportation conversation. That eventually led to other publications and kind of more in-depth kind of thinking on this. Basically, a lot of what I've been interested in is kind of how activists and people who are committed to social justice, how we've approached the issues of immigration enforcement as it relates to racial justice, but also as it relates to the prison industrial complex and to questions of abolition. So I proposed this lecture after um, uh, the horrific images of uh, Haitian immigrants being abused by Border Patrol. And I saw a lot of the outrage that people were expressing. And I wanted to honor that outrage and I wanted to support that outrage by trying to also contribute um, to kind of, uh, you know, any information or stuff that people might find useful for their thinking or for their activism in this. We are at a historic moment. It is such a scary and fucked up time in this world but it's also a very powerful time because a lot of us are trying to figure this out. So this is my um, attempt to be kind of part of this conversation that's going on today and that I feel very lucky to uh, see happening and to be participating and to be thinking with all of you in this. So today's lecture, we're going to be going through several different kinds of steps um, in this. So we're gonna start with um, what are departments and agencies that are involved in immigration enforcement? We're going to do a brief overview of what historically have been those agencies and then focus on the major enforcement agencies of the Department of Homeland Security. We're also going to learn about kind of types of immigrants, meaning what are the kind of different categories of admission um, that are uh, understood as kind of bureaucratic categories. And this is gonna be important because a lot of times when we use the term immigrant, we're not always using the language of the state and understandably so. But for understanding kind of how data is collected as well as how different policies have impacted different groups, um, I think this is a very important kind of breakdown that we need to kind of sort through. Um, then we're gonna be looking at some early policies regarding deportation. And we're gonna be thinking about some of the ways that these early policies are um, setting kind of foundations for uh, policies that we'll be looking at and that the bulk of our presentation will focus on in terms of the 1980s and 1990s. Then we're gonna look at some key programs in terms of collaborations between immigration enforcement and local law enforcement today. Um, and we're gonna be thinking about this in relationship to concerns about policing, um, the push for defund the police and abolition as well. And then we'll be looking at um, some of the detention and deportation data. And then finally, we're gonna think about life after deportation. And we're gonna end with um, some very powerful stories 
of uh, deportees who've been able to legally return to the U.S., which is very rare for um, the deportees that uh, we're talking about, but it is happening. And so it gives us some hope about politically what we can try to do. Okay, let's get started. So first I wanna start with just what is the term prison industrial complex? Um, because if you think about the title of my lecture, it's punishing immigrants. Um, and it is uh, you know, thinking about immigration enforcement and its relationship to the prison industrial complex. But not all of us are familiar with this term. This is a term that is also, uh, um, you'll see sometimes in essays or think pieces or on social media, abbreviated as PIC. So when people say the PIC, this is what they're referring to. And so the organization Critical Resistance Right. Um, this is an organization that has been around now for about three decades, and they are a national organization um, that is an abolitionist organization. And they have been uh, they do both organizing policy work as well as political education. And years ago, about 20 years ago, I was at a friend's house in the Bay in Berkeley, and he had a critical resistance poster on his wall. And one of the, you know, it had all these lists of things to abolish, right? Um, you know, abolish this, this, this. And on the list said abolish the INS. And we'll learn more about the INS for those who haven't heard that term in a while. Um, but basically it was talking about immigration enforcement, right? And so for, um, for uh, critical resistance, CR, right? They think of you know the term, um, the prison industrial complex as the overlapping interest of government and industry that use surveillance, policing, and imprisonment as so-called solutions to economic, social, and political problems. And so, um, for them, prison industrial complex obviously involves. Um, you know, trying to free people from captivity in these cages that they call prisons and jails, um, as well as detention centers. But it's also about thinking about how surveillance, policing, and punishment shape social policy, shape, um, you know, access to things like public assistance, shape, you know, schools, how neighborhoods are designed and treated and patrolled, right? So it's a very holistic approach. So in today's presentation, we're going to be thinking about the immigration enforcement as it relates to the prison industrial complex. But we're also going to be thinking about how do we actually think about these relationships? Um, a lot of times, you know, right now in this political moment, as we're having more people make these connections and thinking critically about the PIC and thinking critically about policing and prison and thinking about abolition, um, we also, you know, there's a lot of work for us to do to think about what are these actual connections and how do these systems work together to better understand kind of our critiques and also the way we might direct our energy to trying to dismantle these systems. And so that's the approach we're going to kind of take today, um, as well as we're going to think about kind of our data literacy. And what I mean by that is, yes, we're going to be looking at some numbers and all that good stuff, but we're also going to be thinking about the language we use. Um, how sometimes the political demands we make around immigration enforcement, um, are we always using kind of, you know, the language can shift based upon what the government uses, how people get categorized and dealt with in the system, as well as how researchers use it, and also in terms of our demands. So we're thinking about that kind of data agility um, and ability to kind of move across conversations, but also thinking about the kind of political stakes of our efforts. Um, so here, Let's start with kind of a brief history of who was in control of immigrant admissions. So for a long time, um, states were a lot of times in control of immigration. So obviously we know the United States has been around longer since 1891. Um, and, you know, one thing that's really interesting is states sometimes had rules against or they were trying to propose not allowing people with criminal backgrounds or who had been convicted of crimes from entering their borders. And so there's a very, you know, when we think about kind of border control um, in the early history of the United States, part of the early history of the United States in terms of border control and states being able to decide kind of, you know, and states' rights in terms of who's in their um, population was very much conversations about race, um, you know, these debates about will a state be a slave state or a free state? Will, um, you know, um, a slave, enslaved people be able to flee to that state? Um, does citizenship of 
formerly enslaved people or black people? Does it count in one state versus another? These are different ways that border enforcement has happened. And I'm not trying to equate enslaved people with immigrants, not at all. That's one of the major mistakes that a lot of social justice folks do. But this is part of kind of the history of border enforcement. And so if we think about kind of um, the attempt to get rid of um, criminalized people or people who have been in the system as uh, convicted in some way, states did that um, back in the day. Um, and so in 1891 is when the federal government um, and uh, starts to kind of control immigrant admissions at the federal level. And so you have the Department of Treasury um, was the first uh, department that was in charge of kind of immigration on a federal level. Then it moves to the Department of Labor in 1903. In 1940, as we are entering into World War II, it goes under the Department of Justice, which is kind of the federal government policing agency. And then shortly after 9-11, um, the Department of Homeland Security is um, established, right? And so if we go here, right, um, this is the Department of Homeland Security. And um, one of the things that we see is, and we're going to look at some of this data um, in, in, uh, shortly, but, you know, part of what they do is, well, we'll look at it now. Let's look at it now. So one of the things I want to kind of point out, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more when we get to kind of types of immigrants. This language like aliens is offensive, um, but this is actually the bureaucratic term. And so this is something that sometimes when you hear people talk about so-called illegal aliens, right, you never really hear people say legal aliens, right? They're usually saying illegal aliens. The two kind of go together in political speech. Um, and alien is often used in a pejorative sense in a political speech. From the state perspective, right, an alien is just somebody, you know, um, who wasn't born here, right, and who is an immigrant in some way. And we're going to learn about how the state uses a different term. What immigrant means um, to them is not necessarily what other people might use the term immigrant for. And one thing is, is that um, here, real quick, and this is something we're going to do throughout, is I'm going to show you some of the data sources. So this is the Department of Homeland Security. We're going to learn a little bit more about um, you know, the different agencies, their enforcement agencies in a moment. But this is where you would go if you want to find out data. It's called the Yearbook of Immigration Statistics. Um, and here we're going to learn what some of these terms mean. What's a lawful permanent resident versus a non-immigrant asylee or refugee? What does that mean, right? One thing I want to point out to you is that they don't provide race-based data. This is a real issue because, you know, it's pretty evident in uh, most, uh, not most, but a lot of immigration scholars as well as immigrant rights activists recognize that um, the immigration system from the past to the present is extremely racist and, you know, um, and very race-based, right? But one thing to know is that immigration data is not provided at the level of race, it's provided at the level of nationality. Um, or region, but they always kind of are doing this by nationality. And so um, I talked about how, for example, I was first interested in looking at immigration enforcement by studying uh, the experiences of black immigrants in the deportation uh, process. I had to use Africa and um, different countries in the Caribbean as proxies for black. And obviously, you know, that's not a perfect kind of match, right? But that was what I had available to me. So what they'll usually do is provide data at the nationality level. And this partly has to do with, and this is something we're gonna be uh, working towards shortly when we look at um, uh, earlier policies, um, is the importance of nationality and kind of national origins in shaping quotas, right? And the kind of contemporary quota system that we have today. And so this kind of comes out of that kind of history, right? Is focusing on nationality. This is why, you know, numbers can be very important, but this is why qualitative data, I always got to kind of, you know, um, rep for the qualitative scholars because I am one, right? Um, and we just get, you know, treated like stepchildren in the social sciences, but okay, whatever. We, we you know, we still do our work. And the thing is, this is why qualitative work is really important. A lot of people who work closely with immigrants um, in detention proceedings or in deportation proceedings, whether it's immigrants themselves, immigrant rights advocates, lawyers, right, um, organizers, 
many of them have a lot of detailed stories to share about um, you know, the racial and ethnic backgrounds of their clients, of people, of their loved ones, of people that they're organizing for and with, right? And so that data is also such an important part because it fills in a lot of gaps that frankly, this data doesn't tell us, right? So now let's go back to here, okay? So the Department of Homeland Security gets established and now it's one of the largest departments in the federal government, okay? And here, we're gonna look at um, three different um, uh, agencies within that that have to do a lot with immigration, but they're not the only ones, right? There are 22 agencies in the Department of Homeland Security, but the two agencies that are associated with immigration enforcement um, that get actually a significant share of the budget of DHS and a significant share of the uh, manpower um, is the immigration enforcement wings, right? So first is US Customs and Border Protection. So if we go here, okay, and we're gonna get into some of the budget and the money in a moment, right? Um, but they have a staff of over 60,000 and 44,000 are armed sworn law enforcement officers. Um, and they are the largest number of all federal agents, right? And they're the largest federal law enforcement agency in the United States and one of the largest law enforcement agencies in the world, okay? And Border Patrol makes up a significant part, about half of these 44,000, okay? And so here, um, we can look at, this is if you were to go, so here you have Department of Homeland Security is dhs.gov, right? And for those who don't know, um, for it to be a federal government website, we'll always have .gov. Right. And so U.S. Customs and Border Protection has its own uh, website. And so here is where you would find kind of some of their information for um, arrest of individuals with criminal convictions. Right. And you can see a very, you know, here it's like 12,000, right? So that was one extreme. And then we're kind of back to the extreme here, right? Um, total convictions by type. So this is what people who are arrested were, um, uh, what they were convicted of. I wanna draw your attention to this, but first let me zoom in because you're like, you want me to draw my attention, but here we go. Let's make this a little bit bigger now. All right. If you look, this illegal entry and re-entry, right, makes up the majority out of all of these uh, so-called crimes. Okay. And they far exceed the number of what would be associated with violent crimes such as sexual offenses, homicide or manslaughter, right? Um, trafficking um, and assault. Okay. So this is something that we wanna bookmark because one of the things we're gonna be talking about is when did illegal entry um, become associated with being a crime? Okay? And when did it start to get prosecuted? But this is something that we see kind of, um, this makes up uh, the majority of what people are being apprehended for. And this is kind of a pattern across years. And so if you're looking for this data, right, it'd be criminal non-citizen statistics, so forth, okay? And this is something we want to bookmark too, is that the term non-citizen, and so this is what gets kind of a little loopy is that when you're looking at these different sources, even if it's all from the federal government, we're going to see that some of this data and some of these sources use different terms to refer to people. Um, and so non-citizen is a way of kind of saying immigrant. Do we know if these are so-called unauthorized? Well, I shouldn't say unauthorized because you know what? That's a trick. I almost walked into my own, you know, because we're going to learn what the term unauthorized mean, right? Do they mean illegal? Do they mean documented or undocumented um, and so forth? So this is stuff that, you know, it gets kind of a loopy and we're going to sort some of that out as we proceed. Okay. So this is here. We're going to come back to this in a moment so we can look at some budget stuff of not only that agency, but also what is known as ICE. Okay. So they have 20,000 staff. And this is what I think is interesting is today people say abolish ICE. Um, you know, it's a lot, frankly, it's just a catchier phrase to say, 
But also ICE is involved in specific things such as deportations and the detentions. And so um, this is also something where you have some debates where people are saying, well, don't just abolish ICE, let's abolish DHS, right? Or let's abolish immigration enforcement or let's abolish the prison industrial complex. These are not all the same demands. And that's something that we're gonna be sorting out as we proceed. So ICE has a staff of 20,000. And in 2000, they changed from the Bureau of Immigration and Customs of For uh, Enforcement, and they assumed programmatic control of criminal alien program. And we'll be learning more what the criminal alien program is in a moment. Um, they are in charge of ERO, right? Um, enforcement removal operations. And so we're going to be looking at data later on um, in the detention data section. And they're also in charge of the 287G program and secure communities. And we're gonna be looking at both those programs um, when we look at contemporary kind of collaborations between immigration enforcement and um, local law enforcement, okay? So now here, right, this is ICE. And you know, see all this propaganda they got going on on the website here, okay. So now, here, they like to brag their numbers, okay? So, removals conducted, we're gonna learn about the difference between a removal and a return, right? Because this is a very different terms in terms of what um, we often will use as deportation as a general term, but these mean different things in terms of the data and also in terms of the process, right? Um, and so here, Think about this, 3.26 million immigration cases managed. They don't really break down what does that mean, right? Um, and so this is its website, but they like to kind of brag about all this stuff, okay? Um, so let's see here. Now, if we go here, this is, an, and this is something I would suggest to people, for those who are not familiar with the Migration Policy Institute, I think it's a very useful resource for a lot of really important kind of data um, reports. They break down a lot of kind of breaking news, data reports. They really dig into some of this research. Some of the researchers did work for, um, you know, immigration uh, enforcement in the past. Um, so, you know, you can judge that as you will. Um, but they do get really into the data and they also break apart kind of historical trends um, in ways that this information is very useful. So I want to show you some of the budget stuff going on here, right? So here, if we look, budgets of major DHS agencies in fiscal year 2005 versus fiscal year 2020, 2020 excuse me. Um, and so here, we think about, you know, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, um, Border Protection, excuse me, right? Um, one thing you see is there's a significant increase in these budgets here. Um, uh, I mean, it's good that we have an increase in FEMA. We want more FEMA, right? But you see a significant increase in these two enforcement agencies um, and a significant amount of money. Now, what I want to point out, though, is... This is very different than the kind of financial support that is given to this next agency. So it's US Citizenship and Immigration Services. And even though they do get funding from Congress, um, they get a very small amount of funding compared to the enforcement programs because Congress expects this agency since 1988 to be uh, a lot partly self-funded through the application fees from people for their immigration benefits, right? And so they have a staff of 20,000, but these are people who are the ones trying to help people, you know, um, a lot of times legalize, get citizenship, right? And deal with kind of asylum cases, okay? And so this is something where, you know, the budget priorities of, um, you know, DHS agencies regarding immigration and the fact that this is, a lot of times, you know, a good significant part of the budget is actually funded by immigrants, uh, you know, and, and fees, right? Um, instead of the federal government in the way that they give huge amounts of money to the enforcement agencies. So let's talk about immigrants and non-immigrants. Now this might sound kind of strange, right? People might be thinking I'm talking about immigrants and quote unquote Americans or native born, but these are two different categories 
of uh, migrants, right? So I'm going to use the term migrant for anybody who is uh, um, originally not um, born in the U.S., okay? But immigrant is the legal term that is used. And this is something that um, is known as kind of an LPR status, lawful permanent resident status. This is also what sometimes people use as the term green card holder or permanent resident alien. And so if we go here to DHS, right, and this is um, under, you know, kind of the immigration classes of admission, okay, um, this is where, you know, basically you have your papers, quote unquote, this is the way people sometimes colloquially talk about it, right? You have your papers and you can live and work anywhere in the United States. And you also are able to apply for U.S. citizenship if you meet certain eligibility and admissions admissibility requirements, right? And so this is something where a lot of times when people eventually might be able to legally sponsor family members, it's because um, uh, they uh, were able to uh, become from a lawful permanent resident to getting their own naturalization and so forth, right? So if we go here, um, one thing is, is that refugees and asylees, for example, are um, under the lawful permanent resident thing. We're going to go back here, right? We're going to open this window back again because we thought it was so interesting. And so this is something where it's not to say that all LPRs, right, um, are all immigrants. There are definitely hierarchies in terms of how they get treated in the system. And also sometimes their life histories that played a role in kind of shaping how they came to the United States, right? Um, and so the United States still very much puts an emphasis on family, um, kind of reunification, right? This is what, um, I don't know if you remember, President Trump was um, claiming that he was going to get rid of so-called chain migration, right? Chain migration is basically kind of another, it's a pejorative way of putting down uh, and trying to kind of vilify um, and, and get um, a lack of support for family reunification. Um, just really quickly, if you didn't know, Melania Trump, when she was not married to President Trump, but they were dating, she got one of the very um, exclusive visas, um, which is basically called an Einstein visa. And it's for people who um, uh, usually are like Nobel Prize winners or people who have like done you know, what are seen as kind of major accomplishments in their industry. So it's a lot of times kind of like scientists or Nobel Prize winners and so forth. Um, she was a model at the time, and there's nothing wrong with modeling, but she was not Naomi Campbell, y'all, okay? And she got the visa, mysteriously, this Einstein visa, um, while she was dating President Trump. She used that visa to get her own kind of, you know, pathway, legal pathway. She also then sponsored her parents, in family reunification with President Trump uh, dismissed as chain migration, and then they recently became citizens. So anyways, I just wanted to share that little story. Um, so you do have this here, right? And so I wanna talk about, very, we're gonna go back to refugees and asylees, but you know, um, I wanna talk about this really quickly. One of the things I said at the beginning of my presentation is that um, a lot of times when I was looking for kind of the experiences of black immigrants in terms of immigration enforcement, like. 20 years ago, um, a lot of the literature, particularly social science literature, would depict black immigrants as kind of um, black model minorities. Um, and they would often kind of depict black immigrants as so-called culturally superior compared to African-Americans. And um, this research has been critiqued, particularly by people like uh, Jamima Pierre, the anthropologist and others, right? Um, but one of the things that I want us to keep in mind is that, um, uh, part of the history of black immigrant migration um, in the 1980s and 1990s, or excuse me, in the 1990s and, and onwards um, from, um, uh, um, from the continent of Africa is with this immigration provision, the diversity immigrant. And the diversity immigrant is for um, groups who've historically have not had significant numbers of migration to the United States, which speaks to a history of racism and discrimination. And the diversity immigrant actually requires certain kind of educational or skill-based credentials. Um, and so a significant number of African immigrants are coming in as diversity immigrants. And sometimes they're depicted as these so-called model minorities, but the reality is 
they're already being, you know, kind of filtered out in terms of class background expectations, which speaks to a level of anti-blackness because they're not able to come in sometimes with as much class diversity as other nationalities, right? It's kind of almost like we only want certain ones from your country, right? And also you're only getting this visa because you've historically been discriminated against um, and continue to be so. So that's just something I want to say here. Okay, so if we go back to refugees and asylum. So one thing is we've seen all these, uh, many of us, excuse me, have seen um, and heard of the terrible images um, that we saw of people at the borders. Um, this is where a couple summers ago, um, a lot of images of family separation. Um, um, and also now we're seeing where people are being turned away at the borders um, or people who are getting terrorized at the border, right? Um, and so what you have is um, many of those people are seeking asylum, right? They legally have a right to come to that border and to seek asylum. Okay. And so refugee and asylee are kind of similar categories in the sense that an asylee is somebody who would meet the definition of refugee, but they are already at the border or in the United States, right? And they have a legal right to seek asylum, right? Does that mean that they'll necessarily get it? No, right? But should they be put into detention or deported? No, right? And so what we're seeing is really going against this, right? Um, now, this is an essay, and I had just mentioned Dr. Uh, Jamima Pierre, who um, is an anthropologist. And one thing is, is that um, we're going to be looking at a lot at the role of the criminal justice system in immigration enforcement. And historically, a lot of Black immigrants have gotten deported from the United States because of, um, because of criminal convictions. Um, and we're going to look at some of these data patterns uh, later on when we get to the detention and deportation data. But there's an increasing number of um, Black immigrants who are also applying for asylum, right? And so some of the racist images that we're seeing are of these immigrants trying to get asylum, um, but also sometimes they are also experiencing racism in Mexico or in Caribbean or Latin American countries trying to get to the U.S. border. Right. So there's also a lot of racial politics and sometimes anti-blackness of who even gets to the U.S. border to even be turned away. It is not a privilege to be turned away. It is not a privilege to be violated. But who racially even gets to that border to try to even make the appeal for asylum? There's a whole bunch of racial politics within the history of that. Um, in fact, Dr. Uh, um, Pierre talks about how um, she interviews many um, uh, black immigrants in the detention facility who are seeking asylum. Not only are um, a lot of these Haitian immigrants um, uh, dealing with anti-blackness, they're also dealing specifically with anti-Haitian racism. And a significant number of Caribbean scholars and activists have talked about anti-Haitian racism being a very specific kind of um, a form of racism that Haitians experience. Dr. Pierre, in fact, talks about how um, in some cases, Haitian immigrants, um, if they can try to pretend that they're African um, in different countries, they sometimes will get treated mildly better, right? So there's levels to a lot of this stuff, right? But all this to say is that even before people get to the border and um, are trying to seek asylum, there's a lot of racial politics that sometimes they are experiencing in terms of police and immigration enforcement and um, discrimination on the path there, okay? So this is, these are all categories of admission that would be considered LPRs, right? Legal, lawful, permanent resident or immigrant, right? So when the state is using the term immigrant, sometimes they're using it kind of, you know, in a political level, just to say kind of, you know, foreigner, right? Um, sometimes they're using in this kind of level to praise a so-called immigrant identity or culture, right? In this kind of chauvinistic way towards racial born, uh, US racial born minorities, right? Um, but from a technical standpoint and in terms of the data, right? This is a specific kind of category. This is also something when we get to the section on the 1980s and 1990s, we're gonna see where a lot of kind of grounds for admission and the kind of rights that are increasingly taken away from immigrants um, to try to get deportation relief um, are gonna target this group, right? Okay, so, now, non-immigrants, 
this is a term that, you know, it might sound a little strange, like what's a non-immigrant, but it's actually kind of a category of um, admission. And it's basically where instead of, you know, lawful permanent residence, it's the assumption that you're trying to stay here permanently. Well, non-immigrants are, you know, where you're legally admitted to the country temporarily and for a specific purpose. So for example, years ago, I don't know if some of you might remember, Amy Winehouse tried to kind of come to the United States to perform, I think at the Grammys, and the US wouldn't give her a visa, right? She would have had to apply, you know, her, her application would have been under the non-immigrant admissions um, visa of kind of a tourist visa, right? And so this is something where um, increasingly more scholars around immigration enforcement are dealing with the non-immigrant admissions category. And this is important because a big part of how people, quote unquote, um, when we talk about illegal immigrants, right? A big part of how people, quote unquote, become illegal is by overstaying their visas. And if you are admitted in a temporary way, whether it's a student or um, you know, as a worker, right? Um, or as a tourist or a business person, um, you are, you know, sometimes you might overstay your visa, right? So part of what happens is a lot of the undocumented people in the United States, people who don't have the legal documents to be here, right, um, are sometimes coming in the United States illegally, right? Um, and they might be coming in as, L, you know, to hope for LPR. Um, they might have had, you know, problems with the law or so forth. And, and, but you also have non-immigrant um, who also might have problems with the law, or they might just overstay their visa, right? And then they become undocumented and illegally here. Okay? So the term overstay is actually a technical term that uh, the Department of Homeland Security uses. And so, um, and so this is basically, uh, they would technically legally not be here, or like be here illegally, excuse me, okay? Now, this is a book that I highly recommend um, by the sociologist Philip Kretzedemus, um, and it's called The Immigration Crucible, Transforming Race, Nation, and the Limits of Law. Uh, Dr. Kretzedemus, he um, writes about the importance of, um, he's writing about the importance of the non-immigrant admissions category as a larger share of the overall immigrant population are coming in as non-immigrants. And so um, it both speaks to kind of wanting to try to make immigrants temporary um, in different ways, but it's also a way of, um, uh, you know, he talks about neoliberalism and he often about not having to kind of invest in immigrants in terms of, you know, kind of a strong public sector and so forth, right? And so I highly recommend this book. Um, and uh, by the way, I just want to say, um, Dr. Kretzedemus, he's editing a volume called Modern Migrations, Black Interrogations, Revisioning Migrants and Mobili Mobilities Through the Critique of Anti-Blackness. Once again, Modern Migrations, Black Interrogations, Revisioning Migrants and Mobilities Through the Critique of Anti-Blackness. Um, and I've been invited to contribute a chapter to this book, and it will feature a lot of books thinking about anti-blackness and immigration enforcement on a global level. Right. Um, and so that book is um, under contract at Temple University Press. Okay. Now, if we go back here to immigrant admissions here, right? Unauthorized immigrant. Let's talk about this. One of the things is, is we hear the term illegal immigrants a lot of times, and um, there's a lot of effort to get rid of the term illegal immigrants. I don't know if some of you remember um, the whole Drop the I campaign. And this was where, um, you know, uh, media folks, uh, social justice activists, race, racial justice activists, they're pushing for the media to, use, to stop using the term illegal immigrant. And so there's this whole drop the eye campaign. Um, the thing is, the term illegal immigrant is kind of a political language, right? Um, and it's a, a kind of a media language and some messaging language. And obviously it's usually meant to um, send a negative image of immigrants and to kind of promote anti-immigrant sentiment and xenophobia. Um, but you don't really see this term used kind of bureaucratically in the same way. And you don't see it used um, 
in terms of kind of the data either, right? And so you do see people say, how do we estimate the illegal immigrant population or so forth? Sometimes people will use the term undocumented, right? And so undocumented going back to kind of this issue of having to have a document or a visa in some sort of way that says you are legally here right? um, and allowed to be here. But the term unauthorized, right, has sometimes also been suggested as kind of a, a better term to use than illegal immigrant. But from the state perspective, unauthorized immigrant means something very different, right? So for example, an authorized immigrant <clears throat> here, um, it can mean anybody, it's basically, um, you know, you can be an unauthorized immigrant if you're a non-immigrant. Right? Um, you can be an authorized immigrant if, an, if you are adjusting your status to LPR status. Um, if you are a TPS, right? Um, temporary protected status. And we're gonna learn a little bit more about what that means later on when we look at later policies. Um, and this is something that is very important for thinking about people um, who are concerned about their status being revoked and being possibly deported, right? Is if they lose TPS status. Um, and so this is something where this is part of kind of, you know, thinking about our, 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 our data literacy is that terms that we're sometimes figuring out what to use as replacements for, you know, terrible terms like illegal immigrants, sometimes those terms are already kind of in use and they're in use in a bureaucratic sense. And that means a very different thing in terms of immigrants navigating the bureaucracy of their status and of their papers and of having to kind of deal with, you know, um, reporting themselves and so forth to immigration authorities. <clears throat> So, all right, here we go. Now, here, right, criminal aliens. Now, this is something where this is a term, this is the definition basically from, you know, the general accounting office. Um, this is something where, you know, um, how criminal aliens are understood by the Department of Homeland Security. Is it that you got a conviction in the criminal punishment system, meaning were you convicted of a felony or misdemeanor, right? Or is it that you had an immigrant-based violation um, that would technically be considered a misdemeanor, right? And therefore criminalized. And so in the scholarship and in the kind of policy work, people sometimes distinguish between an immigration crime or an immigration-based offense versus a crime that gets associated with being um, punished through the criminal legal system for um, a, a felony or for a misdemeanor that's not immigration violation, right? And so this is something, again, that we want to think about what do these terms kind of mean and how we use them kind of differently, but what does that mean for kind of the data that we're using and thinking through these issues with? Okay, so let's talk about early policies really quickly. So, in 1798, so, you know, not that soon after, you know, the United States, you know, uh, and the Constitution, all that stuff, right? You have the Alien Enemies Act, and this is, and the Alien Friends Act. And so it empowered the president to deport, basically, any non-citizen deemed dangerous. Okay? In 1875, and this act has gotten increased attention in the wake of anti-Asian violence kind of concerns, um, as more and more people have been talking about the long history of anti-Asian violence, particularly through immigration citizenship policy. So the Page Act was in 1875, and this was the first act to kind of create a federal idea in the federal immigration policy of immigrants we don't want, those who are seen kind of as undesirable and that we don't want to admit to this country. So that included, they didn't want prostitutes. And what's interesting is prostitution wasn't actually illegal in a lot of areas, right? Um, it was sometimes treated as a vice or as kind of a nuisance or quote unquote immoral, but it wasn't always illegal, but it was made to be kind of this, you know, category to be barred from entering the United States in 1875. But also they didn't want people who quote, you know, forbid persons who are undergoing a sentence for conviction in their own country of felonious crimes other than political, or whose sentence has been remitted on condition of their immigration. And so basically they didn't want people with criminal backgrounds being able to enter into the United States, right? Even if it meant maybe it was an opportunity for a fresh start, right? And a new life um, for people. 
but they didn't want it. In 1892, so um, with kind of the conversation about anti-Asian violence, there's been increased uh, emphasis on things like the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was the first act in 1882 to bar specific nationality. Well, the Chinese Exclusion Act specifically targeted Chinese laborers. And so other Chinese immigrants, such as tourists and business people and diplomats, could still come into the U.S. You also had Chinese Americans who had already kind of, you know, been living here since the 1850s um, when Chinese immigration first started happening to the United States. So every 10 years after 1882, um, the Chinese Exclusion Act would be renewed. And so Thomas Gary was a racist dude. He was a racist fucker. And he was a, con he was a, a congressperson. And he pushed for the Gary Act. And it required Chinese immigrants residing in the United States to provide proof of legal residency. And um, one of the things is, is that if you were found guilty of not being legally here, um, you could be uh, incarcerated for a year and have to do hard labor, right? And so what you're seeing is this kind of, you know, you're required to show documents, right? Um, but also the way that you could be punished in a very punitive way for not having these kind of documents. In 1921, so if we think about kind of, you know, around, you know, um, World War I here, um, Emergency Quota Act. And so this is important. It establishes the first numerical limits on immigration to the United States. And so even though we had before this kind of categories of who we wanted and didn't want and so forth, right, um, in terms of so-called background characteristics, it's in this era that you start to have kind of what is the origins of our quota system. And that system is with us today, where we have kind of numerical limits and also kind of identify numerical limits for different nations. Okay. So in 1922 is the Narcotic Drugs Import and Export Act. Immigrants convicted and sentenced for importation are to be deported. This is something we want to bookmark for when we get to the 1980s and 1990s, and we're thinking about different drug laws and their impact on immigrants. Now, the Johnson-Reed Act is also known as um, the National Origins Act. And so when I mentioned that a lot of the DHS data, that you can't get the DHS data at the level of race um, or even ethnicity, you have to go at the level of nationality, right? Well, Dr. May Nye, and we're gonna um, look at some work of hers later on, um, the immigration scholar, Dr. May Nye has talked about how it was around this time that kind of, you know, things like the invention of the passport, and wanting to kind of know not only what nation are you from, but what nations have you been to and kind of tracking people's travels in terms of nations, right? And so part of kind of the history of also tracking immigrants is through documents. And so, you know, this is not something that's totally new during this time period, but this idea of kind of, you know, these uh, limits and wanting to also associate these numerical limits with nationality right, is also part of kind of some of the importance of passports or different documentation in that way. So they create a national origin system. And this was, you know, doing these kind of calculations around kind of what percentage of the share of the United States had national origins from certain regions and so forth. And basically, it was a way to try to privilege kind of, you know, um, Western and Northern Europe. So it's with this act and other acts that you have Eastern Southern European immigration reduced significantly. Um, this act also reinforced anti-Asian immigration laws and anti-Asian being very expansive in terms of a range of Asian ethnic groups, some of whom might not even look at each other as Asian. They might be like, you're Asian, I'm not Asian, are you Asian, I'm not, you know, whatever, right? But they're considered Asiatic by the state, right? And so, um, this is something where you, this law is extremely significant for understanding kind of the history of immigration enforcement in terms of uh, numbers and quotas and so forth. So in 1924, the same year as this act is passed, the Labor Appropriations Act is passed and that's what establishes the Border Patrol. Okay. So let's talk about unauthorized entry because you know when we looked at some of the data regarding ICE, right, um, and, and Border Patrol, excuse me, uh, Border CBP, I always get that acronym confused, right? So we'll just call it the Border Agency. Um, and so uh, remember that unlawful entry or re-entry, right, was the largest share of crimes um, that they had uh, apprehended people for. So in 1924, 
this is when, after July 1st, 1924, um, they, you know, establish that there can be a deportation of any time of any person without a valid visa or without inspection. In 1927, there's this kind of idea of voluntary departures, um, unauthorized immigrants without criminal records who can kind of voluntarily depart. But you know, this is also something where we want to think about, this was used a lot of times racially, right, against uh, particularly um, unwanted non-white groups. Um, it's also with always the threat that if you don't kind of get out of here, right, and voluntarily depart, that um, more forceful means could be used against you, right? So in 1929 is when Congress makes unlawful entry a misdemeanor. Um, and so it's punishable by one year of imprisonment or $1,000 fine or both, which is a significant amount of money. I mean, even today for a lot of people, but especially in 1929, right? Um, and so um, you could get in trouble also if you try to re-enter, right? And there can be even stiffer consequences. And one of the things is, is that this was rarely prosecuted. So even though this is put on the books, this is rarely prosecuted by federal authorities until early 1990s. Now, there are other legal means that sometimes that they would kind of get rid of groups. And so there's a long history of, for example, Mexican immigrants being denaturalized or being expected to kind of leave in large numbers, right? Um, uh, and so there's also other ways that, you know, um, they might not have kind of prosecuted people for this, but there are ways that they try to kind of um, prevent groups from entering the United States that they had previously allowed to enter or that they did not want to enter through other means. Okay. So this is Dr. May Nye, and um, she is the author of this article here. And she's also the author of the book, Impossible Subjects, which uh, um, many people who study immigration policy are very familiar with. It's a very well-known book. And this is an article I would recommend for people who have access to it and interest the Strange Career of the Legal Alien, Immigration Restriction Deportation Policy in the United States. And one of the things I thought was really striking was that um, she talks about the responses and the critiques against deportations that were happening in the 1920s. Because it was in the 1920s that you saw an increased amount of deportations happening. Um, and so forth. And so even though they were, you know, prosecutions for kind of unlawful entry didn't ratchet up until, you know, much later, deportation significantly increased. And this is something that she talks about, Dr. Nye talks about in this article, is she says, you know, if you're going to kind of put these numerical restrictions, you're kind of setting the stage for an increased number of deportations as part of immigration enforcement. And the immigration enforcement becomes largely about kind of either keeping people out or deporting them, right? But this is what I thought was interesting. She says, the application of the deportation laws gave rise to an oppositional political and legal discourse, which imagined deserving and undeserving illegal immigrants and concomitantly just and unjust deportations. These categories were constructed out of, oops, you know what, can you tell, I was putting this presentation together late at night, one night, so it's out of modern ideas. This is not her type of, this is mine, okay? So blame this on me, doc, doc, not Dr. Nye, okay? So these categories were constructed out of modern ideas about social desirability, in particular with regard to crime and sexual morality and values that esteem family preservation. Critics argue that deportation was unjust in cases where it separated families or exacted other hardships that were out of proportion to the offense committed. As a result, during the 1930s, deportation policy became the object of legal reform to allow for administrative discretion in deportation cases, okay? So I want us to kind of think about this because this is something that I found, you know, interesting thinking about how today, how do people critique deportations? A lot of times we use very similar discourses, right? Deserving versus undeserving. Right. Um, you know, who are the ones that deserve to be rescued from deportation? Who are the ones that um, don't deserve it? Right. How do we kind of focus on ideas of kind of, you know, the family and very specific heteronormative visions of the family in many cases. Right. But also this is something here that we're going to be thinking about later when we get to the 1980s and 1990s in terms of um, the, the kind of push for more discretion of judges in, in terms of kind of being able to kind of possibly stop a deportation, 
And so now we're here, 1980s and 1990s, right? One of the things that we're going to be looking at is we're going to look at a series of policies and the way that they expanded, we're going to focus on a couple themes in these policies. Um, they're expanded, the, the introduction, excuse me, of aggravated felony and the expanded definition of what can constitute an aggravated felony and how aggravated felonies are used as a grounds for deportation. We're also going to be thinking about um, the way that um, relief, deportation relief, and opportunities to apply for relief are increasingly being taken away during this time period. And also the way that judges' discretion in terms of trying to take into account contextual factors are also being taken away. And so these are the three kind of connecting themes that we're gonna look at as we proceed through these, right? And part of what we wanna keep in mind in this section on the 1980s and 1990s is that what is considered um, immigration policy isn't always kind of just immigration policy. A lot of these laws that are kind of, you know, laws applied to everybody have very specific provisions in them that affect immigrants. So in 1980s, Congress focuses more on, quote, criminal alien problem. Now, this is not to say that they didn't quote certain immigrants in the past with crimes or that they didn't target them for enforcement or for criminalization. But this is part of the zeitgeist of this kind of tough on crime, um, you know, period and of kind of, you know, and this is the period in which they're also ratcheting up and what becomes kind of the beginnings of mass incarceration in the United States. So in 1986, we have the Anti-Drug Abuse Act. And what's important with this act <clears throat> is it introduces kind of lengthy, uh, not introduces, but it helps solidify lengthy mandatory minimums for drug offenses and disparity in sentencing for crack versus cocaine, right? So this is an article, and I just wanted to draw attention to this article. This is by Dr. Teresa Runstentler. And if you don't know, she does a lot of work on racism, um, criminalization, and sports. And so she wrote um, her first book on uh, Jack Johnson, uh, the boxer, but now she's looking at how black athletes um, were kind of targets of Reagan's war on drugs. And how, um, uh, and so she looks at, for example, the case of Len Bias. And Len Bias, for those who remember, was a star basketball player who uh, died um, uh, a drug-related death. And it got a huge amount of attention. And it was also something that kind of people seized upon to kind of stampede um, you know, um, a certain kind of drug laws, right? So he was not the cause of it, obviously, but they, his case garnered so much attention as this kind of specter of what could happen, right? And so this is an article that she wrote, uh, Racial Bias, the Black Athlete, Reagan's War on Drugs and Big Time Sports, for anyone who's interested in kind of some of these themes, and she is working on a book about it, right? Um, so, um, let's see here. So one of the things is the sentencing for uh, crack versus cocaine. Many of us know um, by now that um, uh, there's no medical difference between crack versus cocaine, um, but the way that crack was uh, criminalized differently than cocaine and the sentencing disparities in terms of what you would be sentenced for, right? Um, and so this is also part of that. This is an article, by the way, about Marion Fishman, for those who don't know, who was a doctor who did a lot of work um, and did some really groundbreaking work looking at the medical uh, you know, um, effects of cocaine and who you know, said there's not a lot of differences you know, between cocaine and crack. She also, by the way, was um, a mentor of Dr. Carl Hart, who also has been um, a very uh, innovative drug scholar and scholar of kind of drugs and um, social policy. Um, and so this is something where you have these drug laws. And so part of, I just want to point out, and this is something we're going to think about, um, because in response to mandatory minimums, right, part of the history of mandatory minimums comes out of this concern about, um, you know, uh, prosecutorial and judicial discretion, meaning there are concerns that judges or prosecutors were being very discriminatory towards certain groups, primarily minority groups, right? And so there was rightful concerns about racism and sentencing and so forth. What happened was 
um, you know, uh, those very real concerns, um, some lawmakers use that to kind of push for mandatory minimums. Some saw mandatory minimums as a way of equalizing, right, as a way of equalizing everything and kind of saying, you know, we're going to try to, you know, make sure that if you do this crime and you prosecute for it, you know, and convicted, this is the automatic sentence you'll get and you won't have any disparities. Right. Um, and so this is part of the debate about kind of discretion of judges or prosecutors and so forth, particularly judges. Right. And sentencing, should there be discretion? Right. But it's kind of like, do you get discrimination from a judge or do you get a mandatory minimum? These are terrible choices. We deserve better choices. Right. I mean, this is why we need abolition. OK. And so here, for example, this is the organization for those who don't know families against mandatory minimums. Right. Um, and they are a very vocal organization talking about the impact of mandatory minimums, particularly in terms of drug laws against them. OK, um, so this is something where these drug laws impact immigrants. One thing is it classifies all controlled substances as drugs for purposes of establishing grounds for exclusion and deportation under immigration regulations. And so a large number of people who end up getting deported for being convicted of a crime in the criminal punishment system um, are deported under drug laws. I mean, they're getting convicted of drug laws, right? Um, and so today it's like, I think, um, don't quote me, it used to be like 30 um, grams of marijuana or less for personal use or something like that, right? But, you know, the strictness of kind of, you know, all control is purpose of establishing grounds. And so part of what you see here is under a drug abuse act, there is this kind of deportation policy towards immigrants here. Also, what happens is in this um, anti-drug abuse act is they establish a pilot project in four cities to local, link local police with federal immigration agents. So there's a long history of people trying not to get their local police forces to a law, local law enforcement, they don't want them to collaborate or to cooperate with the federal government in terms of immigration. We're gonna be talking more about that with sanctuary cities and secure communities and all this stuff next, but this is part of that history, okay? Um, and this uh, project started in Miami, okay? So then you have IRCA. IRCA 1986 is basically, you know, it, it was a mixed bag like a lot of immigration policy, but basically in short, it allowed kind of amnesty for a lot of undocumented immigrants. And if you read some of the scholarship about people who are, um, you know, kind of, uh, who are thinking through the IRCA policy, they talk about like all of the work that different organizations did, you know, talking about what are the risk of their constituents who are undocumented, you know, applying, right? Like, you know, would they successfully get it? Would it be used against them, a form of surveillance or entrapment and so forth, right? So IRCA is what establishes the criminal alien program. And um, it subjects, quote, criminal aliens to expedited deportation hearings conducted while they're still in correctional custody. So this is another theme of the 1980s and 1990s we're going to look at is also this interest of the state to kind of deport people as quickly as possible and to try to um, do so to also avoid and also take away um, immigrants' abilities to try to kind of appeal their cases. So aggravated felonies. In 1988, um, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, the second one, it introduces this concept of aggravated felonies. And so felonies usually are, you know, um, things that you're convicted of as a crime in the criminal legal system um, that usually carry a sentence of a year or more, which means that in many cases, if you're going to be incarcerated, you're going to be incarcerated in a prison because most people in prisons are incarcerated because of a felony or for a sentence of a year or more, right? But they create the special category, quote, aggravated felonies. And for the this act, this is what that meant, murder, drug trafficking, and illegal trafficking of firearms and destructive devices, right? So these are some pretty heavy kind of, you know, um, uh, offenses here, right? But they incorporate into immigration law as grounds for deportation. And this also lends support to the criminal alien program, 
right? And again, about kind of trying to complete the deportation proceedings before the immigrant is released from correctional control. And this idea that the immigrant is to be deported immediately after completing a sentence. And so again, what if that immigrant wants to try to fight their case or wants to remain in the United States, right? <clears throat> So this is also connected to the theme, as I said, we're gonna look at of less relief from deportation. So the 1990 Immigration Act, this is also what gives us the diversity visa, right? But here, this is what temporary stat protected status is. And this is uh, the program that gets created in 1990. Um, this is where um, people uh, get kind of a temporary protected status because of what are seen as kind of political, or natural disasters in their home countries, right? So this was of March, 2021. There have been some more countries that have been added to this since, right? But these are um, the 10 countries of March, 2021, okay? And so this was something where you saw a lot of concerns under President Trump's administration about would temporary protected status be um, repealed and would it, or would certain countries be taken off the TPS list? Um, many people who are here under this program, um, some are more recent, but many have been here for years and have built lives here, right? Um, and so if you go to the website here, this is under the U U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. So if you want to learn about this program and you want to learn about what countries, right? And so there are some additional countries like Myanmar and so forth. <clears throat> this is where you'd find out some of that data, okay? Um, okay. Now, here we go. So 1990 Act expands list of activities considered aggravated felonies, right? So again, this is a constant theme, this expanding what can count as an aggravated felony. Right? And so then also eliminate federal judges' power to recommend against deportation based on compelling evidence. So here you're starting to take away kind of, you're increasingly taking away judges' power to try to kind of, you know, say, let me hear your story, right? Um, let me kind of, you know, make a decision that might help you, you know, um, not be deported, right? It's increasingly taking that away. Um, also though, it's allowing immigration judges to enter deportation orders in absentia if an immigrant fails to appear at a hearing. And again, it's pushing for expedited removal and it's seeking to remove legal remedies right, um, by making it more difficult to obtain waivers. So then 1994 Immigration and Technical Corrections Act, again, we see they're expanding the list of aggravated felonies to include additional kind of crimes, right? Um, that could be considered uh, deportable offenses. So, in 1996, there's the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, and it expands what counts as aggravated felonies. So, you know, here's some more stuff. Now, crimes of moral turpitude. This is a, you know, kind of a broad category, and it sounds kind of, you know, what is that, right? And it hasn't always been kind of clearly defined. Sometimes it's seen as kind of theft or fraud, right, or this idea of kind of deception of some type. This is a phrase that you see in kind of old immigration policy, right? So, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, but it's still a term that, you know, is part of kind of these policies as listing and, and so forth. And so what you have is this kind of constant theme of aggravated felony is kind of a broad kind of conceptualization and we're gonna kind of make it what we want and we'll fit in these crimes. And so this is something that immigration advocates have talked about sometimes is there's not just a list that says you'll be deported for these crimes, it's aggravated felony, and then we'll decide what crimes are aggravated felonies, right? But also the same for moral turpitude. More, you know, um, as I said, in immigration policy, you often saw the way that being accused of moral turpitude could be used both against you from being admitted to the country, but also used as kind of grounds for, you know, exclusion or deportation, right? So this is something where, again, what does this mean, right? So also here, this is what I was getting at, drug offenses, right? Grounds of deport deportability as well as crimes of moral turpitude. This is also part of what's happening in the 1980s and 1990s, mandatory detention. Okay. Um, and so this is um, 
you know, uh, the fast tracking as well. This is a constant theme, right, of trying to fast track. And so, you know, given immediate deportation orders. And then, again, taking away kind of judicial discretion and judges, you know, abilities to sometimes um, say, you know, I think that you might, you know, um, have served your time or that you deserve another chance or, you know, whatever it is. And then this was a policy, the Francis Discretionary Waiver of Deportation, that took into account a lot of kind of, you know, factors into kind of somebody's situation. And this was something that was only available to, you know, legal immigrants. Um, so it wasn't something that was available to uh, people who are, quote unquote, illegally here. They're being put through the system. But this also gets taken away. And so what you're also seeing increasingly is that legal permanent residents who are going through immigration enforcement, um, whether it's through, um, and, and particularly those who are being uh, entangled into the criminal punishment system, and then are going through immigration proceedings through that, right? Um, they are increasingly, their rights as legally being here are increasingly being eroded, right? And so, you know, when we think about desirable and undesirable immigrants, right? Um, you know, the mark of kind of criminalization in the criminal punishment system plays a big role in kind of your downfall, basically, and your, you know, your kind of vulnerability in the immigration enforcement system. Okay. Now, this act was passed, um, uh, and it had a major impact on um, uh, um, people on death row. It really kind of, you know, it, in terms of ha the writ of habeas corpus and so forth, right? Um, and it was in the context, as people many know, of this mass murder, right, by Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma City bombing, right? Now, McVeigh, um, he bombed the Oklahoma City bombing. I don't know if people who remember uh, when this happened. I remember it. I um, and, you know, children were in that building, right? Um, and so uh, there, you know, it, it was a horrific thing. This is something I want to draw attention to you. This is, a, this is an article from 2001, right? Around the time that um, he was about to be executed. Um, I want you to see this bullshit of how they wrote this article here. Early reports suggested that a Middle Eastern terrorist may have been responsible for the carnage, but within days, federal authorities linked the attack to an all-American looking young man who appeared more like the boy next door than the epitome of evil. Right? And I remember when you know this bombing happened, and a lot of media commentators and news reporters were suggesting and openly, you know, and explicitly suggesting that it was maybe a Middle Eastern person or a Muslim. Right? And they're putting that out there. And it ends up being a white nationalist militia dude, Timothy McVeigh. And so one of the things that happened was this act was passed um, shortly, you know, like a little over a year. And one thing that um, scholars have talked about is how Congress was kind of in a hurry to pass this to make it by the like one year anniversary of the bombing to kind of signal the sig symbolic kind of message about it, right? <clears throat> so Ira, Ira, and this act gets a lot of attention by immigrant rights activists and anti-deportation activists and understandably so. So again, it expands the definition of aggravated felonies, including like, let's say now shoplifting, right? It also, this is really significant and made the expanded definition of aggravated felony retroactive. What does that mean, right? So you could be a legal immigrant, you could be an LPR, for example, and let's say you committed an offense in the past and you might have served your time or you might have had, you know, you might not even served any time. Maybe it was a misdemeanor, right? And it might have been something that would not have allowed you to be deportable in the past. It might have been a misdemeanor or something like that, right? But if that act is now considered an aggravated felony, right, um, that, you know, whatever is considered an aggravated felony in 1996, and you committed, let's say, 20 years ago, and it wasn't, you could still now be open to deportation because it's retroactive. 
right? And so what that meant was the 1996 law had a huge impact, not just on people who are kind of currently in the system, but a lot of people who had gone through the system and they might've even kind of, you know, gone through the system as a misdemeanor or whatever, right? But now they could be deportable. And, um, and so this is where you saw a lot of ramping up of kind of anti-deportation activism in the face of this, right? You also have, you know, a new expedited removal process. And so this is where, you know, kind of uh, at ports of entry um, in terms, of, and again, an emphasis on fraudulent documents or misrepresentation. Um, and this is something where you're also trying to bar people um, in terms of reentry and possibly maybe even permanently, right? If you're trying to reenter fraudulently, like quote unquote, right? And so this also becomes completely barred those convicted of aggravated felony from applying for certain types of relief and made it much more difficult to be granted what is now called a cancellation of removal, right? So trying to, and, and this is something we're gonna talk about later, but removal is basically what it means to be deported, right? In terms of kind of forced to leave. The other, you know, um, departures, you're leaving under duress. So you're definitely, you know, not necessarily a lot of people are, you know, and there's a lot of force that's involved in those other departures, right? But they're talking about basically, you know, a cancellation of being forced removal here. Okay. So let's talk about some of the collaborations that are occurring between the police or local law enforcement and, um, and the federal government. And this is some of the stuff that we're seeing being called into question under kind of the call for sanctuary cities. And we're gonna end this section on talking about sanctuary cities here in a moment. So there's a 287G program. This is because it was the section of the IRA IRA, right? And it basically creates a partnership with state and local law enforcement agencies to identify and remove non-citizens amenable to remove from the United States. That sounds so friendly, but basically they're trying to find people that are quote unquote, removable or deportable, right? Um, and so they're trying to re identify them while they're still in state or local custody. Um, and so they enter into a contract with ICE and it is voluntary to enter into this contract. And um, ICE trains local law enforcement in some cases to enforce these immigration laws. And this has been a big source of tension, right? Should um, local police be enforcing immigration laws? Um, and so forth. So there are different types of models. And basically in fiscal year 2020, approximately 920 citizens were swept up through this. Okay. Now a 2011 report found, um, and one of the things that 287G gets kind of touted as is that they're trying to find, you know, the kind of really bad criminals, right? Um, uh, but a 2011 report found that, um, a lot of the people were arrested for misdemeanors and traffic offenses who were kind of swept up in 287G, right? Um, and so one of the things though that we want to think about is that some people, you know, this is an empirical reality, but some people are using this to kind of say 287G is a problem because it doesn't get the so-called right immigrants it's supposed to get, it's getting the good immigrants you're not supposed to get. And so this is where some of the kind of deserving versus undeserving kind of stuff um, it plays out in some of the critiques of these programs. So there's a criminal alien program, and we talked about this a little bit before, and this was something that um, we saw with kind of IRCA and so forth. Provides ICE wide direction support in the biometric and biographic identification, arrest, and removal of priority non citizens who are incarcerated within federal, state, and local prisons and jails, as well as at large criminal non citizens that have circumvented identification. And so this is something as we're thinking about issues like facial recognition, different software and technology, particularly in policing, this is definitely part of stuff that happens in immigration, DHS, right, there's a whole biometric kind of immigration enforcement kind of part of it. Um, and so here, right, so, you know, identifying and arresting quote unquote criminal aliens, right. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, they're trying to challenge is the declined immigration detainers. An immigration detainer is where a local facility, like a jail, will agree to hold somebody, right, um, and, and so forth, um, so that ICE can get there and kind of take them into custody, right? And so this program is seen as trying to help ICE and the, and the federal government, um, particularly with maybe like uh, non-cooperative 
jurisdictions where they think, you know, oh, they're not going to just help us get a detainer. We have to kind of, you know, do this biometric stuff, right? Um, okay. So now the Secure Communities Program, SCOM, right? So this was something that, you know, it was active between these years. And then um, between 2015, 2017, President Obama, he, um, he stopped the program, right? So he was kind of like, you know, cause there were a lot of critiques of the program. So President Obama was like, I hear you, I see you, I'm gonna still keep deporting you, right? And I'll change the name of the program, right? And so one of the things is, his, um, this is secure community. So one thing is, is that um, anytime you are, you know, charged with a crime, your fingerprints go in the system and that goes to the FBI, right? That's regardless of anybody's stats, right? And so there's a fingerprint database, but what you have is fingerprints of those arrested by law enforcement can be matched against federal criminal immigration databases operated by the FBI and DHS. Right? And so this is where Immigration Customs Enforcement may request local jails to hold inmates beyond release date. So this is, you know, detainers and so forth, right, um, to accommodate taking people into federal custody. They utilize the data systems plus the cap, right? Um, and so, uh, oops, let's go back here. And so this is a large part about information sharing, and this goes to kind of issues around data. And this is something that a lot of data justice folks are thinking about is, what data needs to be shared between whom and how do you also try to call for policies to prevent data sharing, right? Part of the issue though, is you're gonna have to deal with the fact that all of our fingerprints end up in this database if we're kind of in the system, regardless if we're an immigrant or not, right? Now, one thing that happens is President Obama, as I said, he got rid of secure communities in 2014 and he starts priority enforcement program. And this was kind of the replacement. And in this program, so if you go on um, ICE.gov, what you'll see sometimes, and also on DHS.gov, is you'll see archived content. And what that's often getting at is content that's now archived. And what they're kind of getting at in some ways, that can mean different things when they're saying it. But here they're saying, like, this is no longer a program that's happening, right? Um, and so if you look, what are their priorities for removal, right? Well, um, they talk about it and their first priority is kind of threats to national security. And then, and you can look at this here if you want, right? You can go to this website um, and look at priority enforcement program. And in this document, they list, they have a link to a document that lists kind of their priorities. So the first is like national security, but one of their priorities is also immigrants with a felony or a criminal conviction. And so again, you know, there's a way where kind of, um, you know, priority immigrants or high priority immigrants are often those with a conviction of some type, right? Now, President Obama tended to kind of prioritize, you know, a certain number of misdemeanors and so forth, right? So he had a little more leeway for what was seen as kind of a criminal profile as a priority, right? Now, this differed from President Trump, right? So President Trump, okay, he reopens, he reestablishes ESCOM in uh, 2017. So here, he issues this executive order on January 25th, 2017, and this executive order got quite a lot of attention. And it's enhancing public safety in the interior of the United States, right? And he basically says, one of his things is, um, he says that um, uh, we're going to, re, um, he wants to kind of focus on anyone convicted of any criminal offense. So he's less interested in kind of, do you have a certain number of misdemeanors? It's just like, do you have a misdemeanor, right? Um, so he's a lot more strict in his definition of kind of criminal background than President Obama was in his kind of, um, uh, uh, his, his alternative for those two years between 2015 and 2017. President, um, uh, um, Trump also makes it clear that he's going to reinstate secure communities. And so that's why we started in 2017. And it was through, you know, kind of his uh, declaration here, right, in the executive board. Okay. Now, this is the document here around prosecutorial discretion, right? And so here are the priorities under the program that President Obama created for those two years, right? Priority one, threats to national security, 
misdemeanors and new immigration violators is priority two. So for Doc, uh, President Obama, it was three or more misdemeanor offenses, right? So here he was saying that he wasn't gonna focus as much on uh, traffic offenses or state or local offenses and so, um, and so forth. Now, here, if we're, let's talk about sanctuary cities because we're seeing a lot of kind of interest in this. And sometimes if you're on social media, um, you'll, you know, um, see people say, I thought this was like, you'll see sometimes people say, I can't believe, you know, they're doing this to this immigrant in my city. I thought we were in a sanctuary city. And so people use the term sanctuary city in a lot of different ways. The thing is, on a very broad level, sanctuary means a city, county, or state limits cooperation with federal immigration enforcement agents. But there's actually no legal definition of sanctuary. Right? Um, and there's no agreed upon definition of sanctuary by states or researchers. Several will use the same one, but there's a lot of different approaches to how to interpret what a sanctuary city is, right? Now, um, uh, Professor Lash, I forget his first name, so I apologize, um, but um, he is a, a law professor, a legal scholar who's written quite a lot about sanctuary cities. And he says, what people get all wrong is when they, is that they hear the word sanctuary, they think it's about harboring people. Unlike sanctuary churches, sanctuary cities aren't pursuing a public act of subversion, but rather a course of non-cooperation, telling their police and jail personnel to refuse assistance of federal immigration authorities in their efforts to deport immigrants. So let's talk about this, is that part of the history of the sanctuary movement was in the 1980s in response to the refugee crisis um, and in response to a lot of um, Central American immigrants, right, from let's say El Salvador and so forth um, in the United States. And they were also changing kind of the racial and ethnic composition of different cities, right? Um, in, you know, Southern California, for example, and so forth. And so what happened was you had a sanctuary movement, but that sanctuary movement was very much civil disobedience, right? And so it was um, you know, churches and other institutions and people saying we will hide people or we will give them harbor and we are willing to kind of take the legal risk to do that, right? So this is actually an article from Los Angeles Review of Books that interviews quite a lot of people um, and it's Sanctuary on Mass, the first time Los Angeles sort of became a city of refuge. And it, and it talks about um, and interviews a lot of people who are part of that sanctuary movement, right? Um, and so this is very different because this is, again, you know, civil disobedience, but sanctuary movements in the United States, it can involve that. But a lot of times it's about kind of city governments um, and sometimes local police departments, you know, kind of expressing a lack of interest in kind of cooperation. But what non-cooperation means can mean different things. So in some cities, it might mean we won't ask for your papers, right, or we won't ask your immigration status. In some cities, it means fighting back against, you know, or not having policies that um, prevent immigrants from being able to kind of engage in contracts like with public utilities companies or renting, as you see in other cities sometimes do in a very vicious way to immigrants. Um, sometimes it means, you know, a state will say, we won't cut off, you know, um, uh, immigrants or undocumented immigrants from public assistance, right? In some cases, it says, we won't give an immigrant detainer. Okay. So um, this is, or we won't allow for that to happen. So this is, or we won't participate in 287G, right? But it can mean a whole bunch of different things. Now, one of the things is in the 1990s, so part of the pushback, so we heard, you know, about how President Trump was threatening sanctuary cities. In fact, in that press, uh, not press release, in that executive order from January 2017, he specifically takes on sanctuary cities. Right. And says, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to chop your funding and so forth. Right. So here right, this is the National Council Conference of State Legislators. And they talk about, you know, kind of what are sanctuary policies and so forth. And one of the things is they talk about different states right, that have enacted sanctuary policies. But in um or have also opposed them, right? So states like Mississippi, right? Um, Georgia, um, you know, um, and so forth, you know, have sometimes enacted, um, you know, um, 
uh, sanctuary and, and so forth. And so you have a whole bunch of kind of, you know, vigilance being occurring, but it's hard to kind of find this data. Sometimes people are collecting this data by kind of news stories that appear and they're creating kind of sketch list of like, you know, what are sanctuary cities and so forth, right? Well, part of also though is sanctuary city, and this is something that, you know, as we're thinking critically about reformist attempts, right, against abolition, um, you know, what Miriam Kaba will talk about, what are, um, you know, non-reformist reforms versus reforms that keep kind of, you know, um, carceral systems going. Well, some of the same conversations are happening with sanctuary city policies. So, for example, right, um, let's talk about this here. In 1979, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you some examples about some of the history of sanctuary policies, but some of the sanctuary policies actually came from police departments. And that should give us some pause in some ways, right? Um, obviously we don't want immigrants to get rounded up. We don't get, want them to get deported, right? But in 1979, for example, the LAPD issued a special order prohibiting police from inquiring about the immigration status of people not suspected of crimes. So here you're already seeing kind of, you know, if I don't suspect you of a crime, but this idea of kind of, you know, the qualifying thing is if you think you're, you know, committing a crime or a criminal. And so they were saying, you know, but here you see it was like, you know, by us not doing that, we'll be able to kind of increase our ability to protect and serve the entire community. And so for some of these police forces, being pro-sanctuary city is seen as kind of helping the police right, in terms of having, quote, unquote, positive relations with immigrant communities. And so um, you saw different cities adopting similar resolutions. And post 9-11, more cities and states enacted policies similar to this model. And they were saying it was to, quote, unquote, build trust with immigrants and to encourage them to engage in crime report, right? So in 1985, Los Angeles has a sanctuary resolution. And they say federal employees, not city employees, should be considered responsible for implementation of immigration and refugee policy. Now, one thing that happened, though, and similar to kind of what President Trump was doing, was um, a Western, uh, um, like a, a, he was like a director or something of like the Western district of the INS, right? And he, but he had a high up role in the INS, Immigration Naturalization Service, um, which would have been like ICE, right? Um, uh, before 2002. And he said, I will, you know, get your funding, right? And so he threatened them with getting, you know, with their funding. And so they put out kind of a more watered down version of this resolution. In 1989, San Francisco, right? Um, they put out this, you know, um, you know, the city and county of refuge it is hereby affirmed that the city and county of San Francisco is a city and county of refuge. Okay? And so they list different things like we're not going to use city funds and staffing and so forth, right? And so you have, you know, kind of um, a, a long history of some of this, but what we want to remember is sanctuary cities in this sense were often very much kind of, you know, driven by politicians and by police forces. This is not to say community advocates were not a part of it, but this is not civil disobedience, right? And I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to judge sanctuary people now and say, you know, whatever, but I'm just saying this is an important distinction that, you know, um, Lash is getting at, right? One of the things also is that part of the issue of sanctuary city that kind of makes it difficult is that there's also still a lot of data sharing via other programs, particularly things like secure communities, right? And so even if, you know, you say we're not going to turn people over, well, fingerprints and all that stuff, right? So this is an article from The Appeal. And by the way, I just want to point out, um, you know, they are a worker-led organization now. Um, they had a major kind of uh, political battle and worker battle, and they're still here, okay? Um, and they're um, worker-run now. So here, this is an article um, about kind of data and the whole role of kind of data collection and kind of making it difficult to actually have real sanctuary in some ways, um, even, you know, when we, when we might want it. So again, you know, a lot of um, uh, social justice is really increasingly about having to deal with data. Okay. So this is an article, um, this is from uh, the legal scholar, 
law professor Bill Ong Hing, and he says, though it may be tempting to regard the current multitude of sanctuary policies as statements in opposition to federal immigration enforcement decisions, the public um, justification offered for uh, the vast majority of such policies generally is presented in terms of public safety. The idea is that by seeking to create good relations and trust with immigrant communities, law enforcement is more effective for the entire community. Right? So for example, so basically what you know, Professor Hing is saying is that a lot of times sanctuary cities are used, are promoted by policing agencies or city governments um, because it's seen as kind of, you know, we're, gonna, we're, we're so-called pro-public safety, but it's also a way to kind of help rehabilitate police's, the police's reputation, right? That we're here to quote unquote protect you and the assumption that, you know, this will help with community relations and that we want you to report crime to us, right? So for example, this is a statement that U.S. Mayor's Police Chief's concern with sanctuary city order. This is in response to President Trump's executive order in 2017. And this was a following joint statement by the U.S. Conference of Mayors CEO and the major city's chiefs association president, right? And they put out the statement. Um, and so uh, critiquing kind of um, uh, President Trump's executive order and so forth. Okay, and talking and critiquing, you know, kind of the challenge to sanctuary cities, right? Well, here, this is the organizations that were part of it, right? Major cities chiefs. This is a pro-policing organization, a professional organization of police executives representing the largest cities in the United States and Canada, right? And so if we go here, we can see what cities they represent. So one of the things that you have is you have, you know, police who are saying we don't want to collaborate with a federal government in certain ways around immigration, but they're obviously not anti-police, right, or anti-policing or anti-criminalization, right? Um, and so that's something to kind of consider. Now, um, President Biden put out his own press release, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, he actually put out a press release. Hold on a second before we get to this one. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, let me see here. I don't have it, but President Biden put out his own press release in 2021 in January. And he said, and his press release, or his executive order, excuse me, was basically saying he's, um, you know, it was basically challenging President Trump's executive order and reversing what he said was President Trump's uh, stuff, right? Now, here, though, if we go here, this was recently 60 Congress members pushed President Biden and Department of Homeland Security to end programs that conscript local police to work as federal immigration enforcement. And so, um, and they were endorsed by organizations like the ACLU, National Immigrant Justice Center, Immigrant Legal Resource Center, and the Visible Southern Poverty Law Center Action Fund and the National Immigration Project United We Dream, right? And in it, they talk about secure communities quite critically in 287G. They talk about these being racist programs and so forth. So there is also, and I encourage people if you haven't to look up this uh, letter, it's available online if you put um, this information in, but this was something where even as President Biden is kind of doing this, you know, I reverse this stuff, as we see with what's going on, especially at the border in terms of people who should be able to request asylum, right? Um, you know, President Biden is doing a terrible job in terms of how he's treating a lot of immigrants. And so, um, but also this is an ongoing struggle, these type of collaborations and these programs, right? Okay. So now we're at immigrant detention deportation. So we're getting really close to the end here. So this is managed by uh, ICE, right? And this is something where the unaccompanied documented children is managed by the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Refugee Resettlement. I have not studied the experiences of immigrant children, um, especially at the border. 
I recommend uh, looking at the work of Ora Bogato, the journalist. You can find her on Twitter, Ora Bogato, and some of you are probably already familiar with her work, but she has done a lot of work covering the experiences of immigrant children um, in uh, immigration enforcement. <clears throat> so detention facilities. These include ICE owned and operated facilities, local, county, or state facilities contracted through intergovernmental service agreements. This can include jails and contractor owned and operated. Now, one of the things that's kind of tricky is that there are competing numbers of kind of ICE detention facilities, right? So on one hand, um, and some of these numbers is because ICE is not super transparent about some of the stuff. So this is the same organization we were just looking at, the National Immigrant Justice Center. Um, they had a three-year Freedom of Information Act litigation in 2015 that resulted in the most comprehensive public release to date, the Department of Homeland Security Immigrant Detention Center contracts, right? So a lot of people are interested in these contracts. What are the, you know, who are these companies? How much money is, you know, happening? What are the terms of the contracts? Um, and this is also questions about who's kind of accountable for the conditions and, and, and so forth, right? Um, so this is something that they have a report on this that came out a few years ago um, that I would recommend looking up. And they have a lot of information here, such as you know, management contracts, inspections, deaths and detention, and so forth, right? Now, ICE does make some of their data available. So if we go here, this is the latest information in terms of their detention data. And this is, for example, there's like about 170 um, you know, facilities that they list, but they also contract with a lot more facilities. And so this is not a comprehensive list. Mm -hmm. um, this is also where they have the numbers of people in detention. And there's some questions I have about these numbers as well. And the reason being is that, you know, if you look at some other um, research, including on the Migration Policy Institute that they've done, the numbers are much higher, right? And so, um, and they might be familiar with other numbers or sometimes they might have access to some of those other numbers that aren't publicly made available. But what you see here, and let me make this a little bit bigger. Maybe now I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller. Okay, there we go. All right, here we go. So. ICE average daily population, right? Um, if we look at length of stay, the average daily population for both agencies is 33,000, right? Um, in the fiscal year overall. So that's a, a pretty significant amount of people detention. But like I said, you know, I've seen other figures that are like 50, 60,000 average daily population and other numbers that people have given on reputable research sites. And so it raises some interesting questions um, and I haven't looked too closely at what uh, data they're putting in their tables and so forth. Um, but you know, this is the data they're making available, ICE is making available on its website. But I would say this is not comprehensive, right? And again, you know, if you look at a lot of the data that people are trying to get from ICE, they're often having to go through um, Freedom of Information Acts or litigation in some way to try to get it, which raises significant questions about why they have to go through those extraordinary steps to get that data. So this number comes from uh, that. This is where you would find um, some of the information about the detention centers as well. So here, if you go to detention management, right, under ICE, this is where they have information about their detention centers, and this is where it has detention statistics. So that's where I got my, this table from. And so this is how you'd find that here. Okay. As you go to detention management, and then you go to detention statistics. Okay. Now, here, Most people leave detention due to being deported, right? So a lot of people are, you know, they're being deported. Um, they are not able to kind of remain in the United States. Right? Now, one thing is, is that we go to, okay, we go to the website I was just at. Awesome. All right. Now, when we're thinking about kind of reforms to the detention uh, program, there, they are, you know, there are certain kind of reforms that have been pushed that um, one is alternative to detention, ATD, right? 
And this has received congressional funding since 2004. And this also can be considered, you know, it can mean different things. So let's look at what this means to them, right? So this is from Detention Watch, and I'll, I'm gonna show you some stuff from um, the DHS in a moment. But Detention Watch is a really important organization and they are, you know, increasingly, you know, a lot of staff people are abolitionists and so forth, right? And so they're looking critically at alternatives to detention and the way that, um, and so here, as they put, this is what it can include. So some of these things, obviously, you know, there are probably many people who prefer this over being, you know, held in a facility against their will, right? But this is something where it still keeps people in what some people have called digital jails um, in terms of what we can think of as maybe digital detention, right? And so if we think about some of the same critiques that have been raised, right? And this is an article, by the way, um, that I recommend people read if you have not, by the executive director of um, Detention Watch, Silky Shaw, and she's talking about, um, uh, you know, kind of the need for more people in the immigrant justice movement to embrace abolition, right? And part of it is because the way some of these reforms are getting kind of used um, to uh, maintain immigration enforcement and carcerality instead of dismantling it, right? Um, so I recommend if you haven't to read that article, right? Um, and here it is again, I, I want you to read it so badly, I just clicked on the link again, right? Okay, I mean, I'm really trying to get you to read this if you haven't, okay. So, uh, let's see here. This is an infographic that ICE put together, right? Alternatives to detention. Okay? And so here, this is what I mean when I say that the role of technology and, you know, just as uh, people have talked about quote unquote digital jails um, and, and kind of as alternatives to incarceration or what is called e-carceration, electronic incarceration, um, you're seeing kind of similar things with immigration enforcement in this um, ATD program. So a lot of different roles of technology and so forth that we can kind of think about as well. Um, let's see here. Okay, there we go. So now here, one thing that has been pushed is what is called civil detention centers. And this is this, and I was like at first, you know, when I first heard of this, I was like, what is a civil detention center? But it's basically detention centers are supposed to be quote unquote, nice detention centers. No, I will not give you feedback, ICE. Um, and so um, this is where, this was a press release of the Carn City uh, Detention Center in 2012, new facility in Texas opens today for low risk minimum security adult male detainees. And it was, you know, where they were touting it as kind of, you know, a better and kind of, you know, more civil type of detention center. And so that's the name they give it, right? Civil Detention Center. And it's kind of a certain model of a detention center. Also, because there's been a lot of critiques around transparency, and this is something in 9-11, I used to see signs at protests or on covers of magazines saying, you know, um, you know, give us their names or like tell us where they are and so forth. Because a lot of people were trying to locate immigrants that had been detained or rounded up in some of these immigration raids, right? In cities like Brooklyn and so forth. Um, and so this is something where um, ICE now has this online detainee locator system. Okay. Now we're gonna finish the last couple slides very quickly. I just got a couple more slides here. Um, but I want us just to talk about removal versus return. Removal is basically what is kind of forced deportation. So we use the term deportation broadly, right? Removal is where you're forced to move, right? Um, and it's also, and it's based on an order of removal. And this has consequences, right? So even though obviously not everybody who, uh, you know, is returned to their country or to wherever country takes them, which can be two different things, um, you know, this is something where a removal has different consequences for possible re-entry. And so um, you, there's usually kind of, you know, a criminal con something that was associated with being associated with a crime, even if it means just being an illegal border crosser, quote unquote, right? But also there can be different rules about trying to legally re-enter in terms of how long or possibly a permanent bar on re-entry, right? 
And so if you look at the data, and this is immigration statistics, right? And so if you go to the immigration statistics, they have a lot of stuff in removals. Okay? They track removals versus returns. Okay? And to them, okay, a removal is forced, but a return is confirmed movement inadmissible or deportable alien out of the United States, not based on an order of removal, okay? Um, even though obviously this isn't always, you know, not forced or not by, you know, totally by choice, right? So this is something where also there's a push for expedited removal. And this is also for thinking about data and technology, electronic national nationality verification program. This is a very controversial program, um, even though it's a program that, you know, the U.S. government does have partnerships with um, these countries here, right? And a lot of people from these countries are some of the ones who are trying to get asylum at the border, right? And so this is something where um, there's been a lot of concerns about kind of the electronic verification when historically there was supposed to be, you know, you're supposed to kind of have communication with the foreign national government about verifying documents instead of just kind of verifying them at the border but instead they're using this kind of electronic stuff, right? So this is a recent um, Human Rights Watch um, report that um, uh, they put out along with other organizations, um, uh, American Immigration Council, American Immigration Lawyers about um, records looking at this program. And this came out, you know, around the same time, you know, uh, uh, President Biden put out his kind of uh, um, executive order, right? Uh, denounces its own air operations, IAO, and they're the Air Operation Transportation Arm. Okay. So they usually will pay cover for certain deportations. Um, this airline goes to, or air operations goes to certain countries, particularly in the US and to Mexico, as well as into um, certain Latin American countries, right? Um, Dr. Tanya Golash Boza, who's a sociologist who's done quite a lot in immigration enforcement, she's actually talked about um, she's talked about uh, how people in Ch Chinese immigrants have to like that they go on a commercial flight, right, and they have to be you know um, escorted and so forth if they're deported. Okay, so the last slide here is there are deportees who are stigmatized in their home countries, and right? Um, with uh, Najara Siciliano Navarro, and I'm really sorry if I did not pronounce your name correctly, but it was looking at what happens to immigrants after they get deported and what are some of the policies and discriminatory treatment they experience in their home countries. And this is a really important part of kind of um, deportation, um, you know, anti-deportation work is a lot of organizations are working with deportees in their home countries around organizing or around trying to kind of just you know, find different forms of support. What you are ha happening though, is there are, have been a few successful cases of people who are deported for criminal convictions who were able to successfully return back to the United States. And so there have been a couple of cases, for example, of Cambodian Americans through the help of organizations like Asian Prisoner Support, um, uh, and um, also Asian Americans Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus. And so this is something that as we fight for abolition of immigration enforcement and deportation, right? Um, and just one thing, we could actually end deportations tomorrow, but that would not stop the criminal punishment of immigrants and everybody else, right? And so you could actually end deportations without ending uh, criminal punishment. So we gotta kind of think holistically around the prison industrial complex. But as we're fighting for that holistic battle, these are some cases that have happened where people have successfully uh, fought for and have um, worked, gotten their legal cases in the criminal punishment system reworked, especially as some of these states are passing different reforms. And then they're able to get um, their kind of immigration status changed. So this is a model for some of us thinking about how to try to get immediate return for some people, and not immediate obviously, but to work in the um, short term for that effort. All right, everybody, we're about five minutes over time. I wanna to apologize to you, the viewers. I also wanna to apologize to uh, the ASL translators and the closed captioner. I wanna thank Kami and David and Tess
And Sean, once again, I don't want to say have a great night. And thank you for um, attending my lecture. Okay, bye.